and who uh, has uh, uh, been uh, an integral part of the building and the development of this school. If everyone had the same spirit uh, and enthusiasm uh, that Mike Townsend has, uh, we'd be going at a lot faster pace. Uh, after he graduated, he uh, went uh, to Covington, Louisiana to work with Habitat for Humanity. Um, and he told me uh, in visiting that uh, he loves his job, he loves his location, uh, and he's excited about his life. And to be a dean, to hear that from a graduate uh, is, is music to my ears. So he, he, he told me that he had some stories he was going to tell if I started telling bad stories on him. And I'm not going to do that uh, because he does have some stories and I don't want to have him have the last word. But I will tell you this, that uh, we're proud of what he's done. Uh, we're proud that he came here, uh, and I think he's got a great future uh, in the world of nonprofits. And he's going to introduce his uncle and his aunt with a very fascinating story. So welcome back from Kentucky, via Arkansas, via now Louisiana, Mike Townsend. Thank you, Skip. I am glad to be back here. And and as, as Skip said, I, I was worried having Skip introduce me, and I was expecting him to tell a semi-embarrassing story, and then having my uncle come up after me, I was trying to prepare for that, too, because my uncle enjoys teasing me as well. Um, but I, again, I'm glad to be back here, um, and I'm very proud and honored to, to introduce my, my aunt and uncle. Um, obviously, I've known them throughout my life. Uh, and in my experience, I, I've, I've watched them over the years, and um, I, I, I really do admire you guys. Um, they, they are people of, of conviction, and, and they're really pioneers. Um, and so for most of my life, I have, have watched them in more of a family setting as they, they try to tear down uh, family traditional walls, and, and they, they challenge a lot of stuff. And they also try to rebuild, re repair bridges within our family. And it, it's really been a blessing to me to watch that. And, and now they've taken it a step further, and they're trying to, to, to challenge the social norms and, and, and build new bridges into the future uh, now that we have an energy crisis, an environmental crisis. Um, the two things, well, the three things they're going to talk about today is, is that they've installed a wind turbine to deal with, with the rising energy challenges that we face today. They have installed a gray water system to deal with, with some of the environmental and global warming challenges. Um, and they're also working on a, a, a community that's supposed to be like a natural, holistic community where, where everything is, is, uh, that's used is recycled and things like that. So I'm very proud to, to welcome my aunt and uncle, Kurt and Christine Mann. Thank you, dude. Thank you. We're honored to be here. I was telling uh, Nicholas as we were flying in all, over all this ag land, I was just impressed to see some tall buildings here. <laughs> I, I do have one small tale about Mike. When we were in uh, Kenya last summer, he was over there working with Heifer. We were at what's called a bush home. and it's, You have these homes that are privately host people, and they're maybe 60,000, 70,000 acres. And I think that morning, or he, he was there in night and I wrote me, we thought, well, how ironic, we're there, he's there, so we must get him up on the weekend to see us. So the easiest way to travel is, is through these small little planes they have, and so we brought Mike up, and I think we were out on the camel ride with our kids that morning or something, so we couldn't go get him. So there's these wonderful Maasai guys, and there's a guy named Moon Guy <clears throat> that says he was going to go to the airport to pick Mike up. And these are dirt fields that you may see any, anywhere from two to 50 tourists at any given time because every, everybody uses the same dirt runway. And so as he was leaving in the Range Rover, he says, uh, tell me what, you know, tell me how, how I find him. And I, and I thought for a second and I said, he is the whitest man you will ever see. <laughs> <laughs> a 
and you know, so you know, we went on our camera horse ride or something and came back, and here's and here's Moon Guy with Mike, and he comes back, he's got the biggest grin on his face, and I said, you know, how how was it? Okay, and uh, something wrong, and he said, no, 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 and he said, you are right, he is very, very white. <laughs> So uh, what we thought we would do is there, there's a little CNN piece. It's about a minute and a half that I think is a good overview. And we've got some slides we can share with you. And then we'll, you know, we'll take questions and we're happy to share our story. I don't know that we gave it as much thought as what Mike has said. We were kind of pioneering. We just really were trying to do something different. And a lot of this started in a very innocent fashion. But please to share it with us. You want to run the CNN piece? Great day for the neighborhood, great day for the city, and great day for the environment. We knew that it was a relatively bold move, and we knew that there are some unknowns. We knew Georgia didn't have maximum wind power, but we said, hey, this is uh, something that we're committed to and something that we really want to try. And so we made a conscious decision, let's, let's give this thing a shot. We just wanted to try something that perhaps was outside the box, and I don't think you can get any more outside the box than this wind turbine. And, and, it, and it, from a practical point of view, made sense for us. So the ec economics, knowing that we may not get uh, maximum you know, return on our dollar, the economics were compelling enough with the other kind of emotional currency of going outside the box and doing something different. Those two elements made it make sense for us. I don't think that you should I inhibit any sort of renewable devices. We obviously believe in historic neighborhoods, but, you know, and historical overlay is not sound unless it embraces modern day needs, and what greater modern day need is there than climate change. It could be anywhere from a seven to twenty year payback, and we truly won't know till a year from now when we judge the average wind speed and we get the software system up, uploaded and truly understand what it's what is pr producing in terms of power. The uh, probably all in cost will be about $15,000, so that'll be about a $3,000 federal tax credit. It would take an acre of mature trees to clean the air that this one sky stream does not pollute. And something's got to change. As my wife says, status quo ain't working. So people have to reach out and figure out what, what, what works for them on a personal basis. So how does that translate? Maybe if more of us begin doing it, it's, I guess it's a tipping point, for lack of a better word. So I think you'll get quicker reaction if people start doing it, talk to your neighbors, and more and more people you know, begin to embrace it on a grassroots level, then perhaps that permeates itself to, uh, you know, to the leaders in government that live throughout the neighborhoods and they carry that message to the leg legislators. So I think it's a snowball effect and it's, and it's everybody working in concert together. In theory, let's say at night everything was off and just our refrigerator was on and there was, there was 12 miles an hour of wind. Then the, then the meter would be spinning backwards so that's where it goes back into the grid and benefits everybody. Oh, oh, you got it. You got slowly, slowly. Yeah! That's great. That was me. <laughs> it was it was rising up, and we had power lines to pass, and it passed the power lines by two inches. So we were making sure we, because then we were going to have to have a new plan if it didn't passed by the power lines, so I was a little excited. Well, as you can see from the photographs, we, um, we live in a neighborhood in Atlanta. It's, um, the lots average about 150 by 50 feet, so it's a real urban, old neighborhood. Most of the homes are bungalow. And um, we bought the bungalow, and we actually ha it had an empty lot next to it. And so we were real attracted to this piece of land. It also was kind of up on a hill. And when we started our renovation, this wasn't even a part of the picture, but we, we had done many renovations before, and we really wanted to take kind of a green, you know, approach to it. And 
and make the process fun. And I was general contracting the majority of it. So I was on site every day. And well, it helped me out. <laughs> Well, just go through some slides. We also want to add some humor to today, so we'll, you'll have some of this from time to time. Make sure you're staying awake. <laughs> well, we... we um, this, is, this is one of the ads that we saw and how this whole thing began. We've, we, we've always lived in town, and as you can see, this green spot, this will give you a sense, if you know Atlanta, there's 285, which is the ring. You've got the airport down south, and we're within a mile of City Hall. We've always lived in town. Our, our last neighborhood that we lived in was where, if you've seen the movie Driving Miss Daisy, glorious old Druid Hills, and so we made a conscious effort to downsize or right size or whatever you want to call it. And we also had a void in our life, so we thought we'd buy a farm that was near the city, and then we went to Italy and got drunk and thought we'd come back and build a village. And then we also, you know, we, we said, well, we love Grant Park. Our children are in the neighborhood charter school there. And if you guys know what that is, it's just a glorious concept. It has all the wonderful attributes of a, of a private school system. You have highly engaged parents, but it's public, so you get a real cross-section of life. So we live in Mayberry. So we walk our kids to school. We're real attracted to this neighborhood. And um, once we bought the house and we were on site, the lot next to us, has two glorious oak trees. And the oak tree in the front didn't look very well, so we had an arborist come out and look at it, and he said, it's got to come down, and it's got to come down in 30 days. And when that came down, it changed everything about the lot. It actually opened up. The sun came in, and it really opened things up. Well, the other thing that we noticed was happening was there was a breeze on the property all the time. And even our neighbors said, oh, this is great. You know, there's always a breeze here. And we have the old traditional dog trot where the front door and the back door are lined up. And um, <clears throat> I was just flipping through Time Magazine, and we had started the renovation. And I saw a small ad. I don't know that we have it in there. And um, it said, residential wind turbine, $10,000. And we were just intrigued and um, went on the internet and just started doing homework on it. And um, Kurt picked up the phone and called the company at Southwest Wind Power. They're out of Flagstaff. And they are a company that started in 1987. They only do uh, residential, they've only done residential wind turbines. Um, if you see turbines on boats, that, that's them, that's where they started. They're in probably 47 different countries. And so they have worked with the U.S. Department of Energy over about a five-year period on this model. It's called the Skystream 3.7. And so they just really had started to advertise for it. And it's what's called a plug-and-play model. You, you plug the, our house. We don't have a battery pack, and that's what one thing that brings the price down. So the house pulls from the wind turbine first, and then whatever else the house needs, it goes to the grid. The beautiful thing is that our state is net metering. So if the turbine's producing more than our house will produce, which probably won't happen that often because we, don't, we are not maximizing this device because we are in an urban setting, and we knew that going into it. But if that, if that, when that does occur, fractional as that may be, that power goes back to the grid. And then, the, and it reverses the the direction that the meter is turning. So, you can imagine that if that's occurring everywhere, even on just a small percentage basis, that adds up quite a bit. And and so we we just we we you know after we finished this renovation, we were going to wrap our costs into a mortgage. So it's a little different than just coming out of pocket. Um, it turned out that the, t the total cost was about 15000 because the foundation cost us about four or $5,000. So once we kind of made the mental decision, we also really compared the cost um, to solar. But let me back up a second. We, we, we did, you know, Southwest Wind Power kind of blew us off a little bit, so to speak, when we called because we're not a windy state. But we were still a little determined because we just felt this breeze. And when you read what, what the 3.7 does is the blades turn at 5 miles per hour. That's not a lot of wind. It creates power at 8 miles per hour. And it, and it has a sweet spot of 12. 
at 12. So Kurt, Kurt types in the Atlanta airport and 20 feet off of the Atlanta airport, the average wind speed was almost 11 miles well, per the, hour. Well, uh, the one thing that we learned in this process is they measure average wind speed typically at the airports at 20 feet off, off, off the ground and Atlanta was 9.3. This device is 35% more efficient than its predecessor. It's also important to note that Southwest Wind Power had been in development with this thing for five years with the U.S. Department of Energy and they came out with it in October of 06, so it's cutting edge technology. And then every 10 feet you go up above 20 feet, there's an exponential increase in wind speed. So based on some satellite surveys and chatting with Southwest Wind Power, we thought that we might get 10.8, so it's not the sweet spot of 12, but it is well above eight. So we thought, look, we know it's not gonna be maximum. As I told people, it'd be better off at second base at Turner Field if there were, if, if there were no stadium because you do have wind friction, you've got houses, you've got trees, but in optimal conditions, it produces power at about nine cents per kilowatt. Georgia power, for us, is pretty cheap. I, I would guess it's pretty cheap here, it's about nine and a half cents per kilowatt. And solar has not gotten there yet, but it's, it's more than that. I've, I've heard, I think, anywhere from 12 plus. So for us, solar was not an option, and we thought, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's just give give this thing a shot. If it doesn't work, we can take the turbine with us. Well, we, we did the analysis on solar, and I think it was about $24,000, $25,000. So the other unique feature of the Skystream 3.7 is that when they developed it, they wanted it, two, man in a, two men in a truck can install it, because they, they want third world countries, they want people that are off the grid to be able to pop it up. But that's also fair to say, if you know what you're doing, it's two men in a truck, which... <laughs> We, we, have a few more, we have a few more slides we're going to show you in a minute that was truly the pictures I was taking, a little more detailed um, of the installation. Um, it's, it's, it, it's important to note in this slide, we, you know, we have the house, we have the vacant lot that had uh, southerly orientation because we did want to have our own vegetable garden. We're going to have chickens there that I'm sure our neighbors will love that as much as they love this. So what, once we kind of made the decision to try, because we can take it down and take it to the next house that we go to. Or we, you know, it's, it, you kind of put it together and you can take it apart. Here's, um, here's a, let, me, let me just go over this, this yeah. uh, design overview. Uh, again, one of the compelling things of this is it's virtually plug and play. It's got everything housed in this, in this housing right here. It's got the inverter, it runs on DC power, which means that you can run a cord 500 feet and there's, and there's, and there's less voltage drop. And then these, these blades, I mean, my son, Rivers, who's 10, could pick up one of these blades and put it on his shoulder. They're, they're, they're made out of fiberglass. And these guys try to think of everything. There's not many metal parts in this thing, so you wouldn't have to lube it because it is difficult to, you know, get, get up 50 feet off the ground with this thing. So they try to think of everything, and it also does what's called yaw, so it'll point into the, into, into the direction to receive the wind. So when it's yawing, it's looking for the wind, and then when it kind of catches it, it's maximizing. And it's cool. It's, it's obviously a very dynamic process. It's not uncommon for our kids to run in and say, "Daddy, it's turning, it's turning." So it's, you know, unlike solar, you can you can tell when it's generating power. And most folks uh, really were concerned about, you know, the top two questions is, "What does it look like?" and "Is, is it noisy?" And to address the noise issue. Uh, noise, and you know, this is all a learning process, travels in a straight path. And when they measured the noise level of the sky stream, it was from 20 feet away. Because it's 50 feet in the air, obviously it's going to be less, but to give you some comparisons, a garbage disposal is at 80 decibel levels, a dishwasher is at 70, an HVAC compressor unit is anywhere from 50 to 60, and this is at 40. So noise was not really an issue, but there was obviously some pent up fear, you know, before this thing sure. went, went up. And so how did the whole thing blow up? Well, you know, much, much like we've told people, it's like having your firstborn child. We told anybody and everybody that we had decided to put this thing up. We sent in a check and we <laughs> were on board. We were committed. Had no idea how in the hell to get the permit, but we were, you know, committed to do this thing. And so then, you know, I made a phone call to a neighbor behind us who's a state uh, rep. I said, look, this is what we want to do. Who do we call? And she said, call the neighborhood planning unit. Called them. They didn't call us back. And I left them a very detailed message. I thought, well, 
they're on board, so I didn't, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did leave four messages, actually, because so, we wanted to make sure that, that we, it was okay to do this, you know, we weren't and just. So then <laughs> I called City Hall, and because this is Grant Park, it has the historical well, overlay that was put in place, I think, in 2001. Mm -hmm. And I sent tons of information to City Hall and went to Urban Design because we lived in Druid Hill, so we were, you know, familiar that, you know, you, you have to jump through those hoops and made some phone calls to them, and they said, well, send me the in information, and, and then we looked at the zoning code, and in fact, they allow renewable devices, and they, and they say a 70-foot tower, wind tower, with no setback. So we thought, well, that's, that's, that's great. So then, you know, I was rerouted to everybody in the city hall, and to Mayor Shirley Franklin's credit, if you believe it takes on the culture of its leader, everybody in city hall was so receptive which, which, which was very heartening to us. That, that was probably yeah. the easiest part of the process. And Good just on. purely out of principle, every time I went to City Hall, I rode my bike there. And so we, we sent tons of information. We, we got it to four or five different departments. And the only really pushback we got was from the engineering guy. He said we want it stamped from somebody locally. So I found an engineer to stamp the foundation. And, and, and we did the beefed up foundation so they wouldn't leave any stone and turn there's, no there's five different types of foundations dep depending on your soil type so we could have done like a class three and we would have been okay but we did a class five and we spent a little bit more money more cement on the foundation and so i rode my bike down to city hall on a tuesday night and went to all the departments they said hey mr man we knew you were coming and come on in and you know one lady said i got a ranch in texas i'm thinking about this and everybody's fascinated us and they were fascinated and we just boom 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 and got all the stamps and came home and had a permit thought great and then my wife called me i was uh, on a trip to lexington to visit some gene pool and she said so and so says their house won't sell because the buyer says he there's there's a turbine going to be put up next next door and that's really what blew the whole thing wide open so i got on the phone with that Homeowner, and it, and it just, you know, it, it, was, it was just a snowball effect from there. And I think this was in June. And uh, then, uh, you know, we tried to talk to them. I talked to the home buyer. And inter interestingly enough, if you know Grant Park, we don't have any photos, but there's power lines everywhere. And from your for front porch, you can see at least eight power, power poles from your front porch. Junction boxes. Uh, we have many, many 70 foot. Uh, high power lines, you know, dripping with lines. Those things don't go through an historic overlay. <laughs> Georgia, Georgia Power has eminent domain to put power poles wherever they want, but we as a society just 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 get numb to it. And so, you know, we I mean, we we obviously didn't really pay attention to the power poles, so all this mess erupted. And interestingly enough, the the, the home buyer has like seven power lines in front of their house, so it was hard for us to see why they had a problem with it and there were some other issues, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I so. think everyone had antiquated visions of what it would look like or it even sound like. So we tried the educational approach. We tried to direct, we sent out a, um, an email. Uh, very quickly what happened what, what was a small group. At the time, we didn't know really how big it was. Met on a corner and we were, we were we're not new to the school, but we're new to the neighborhood. So many people didn't know who really know us. Um, and so this pack of people kind of formed and met in the open, <laughs> even on the house next to us on the front porch, which is a little intimidating. And um, we sent an email out just immediately. I mean, just very, um, we, we operate our lives very open door, and this was our intent, and uh, we felt like we had let some of our neighbors know we've got the proper permits. Please call us. Here's the website. Here's the information. This is what it looks like. This is what it doesn't sound like. And there was a radio silence. And, and then in 48 hours, we got a lawsuit. In 48 hours, there's Which an appeal to appeal our permit, as well as... Within 48 hours, every TV channel shows up at our front door. Um, NPR love calls a, love, us. Love a good controversy. The weather station wants to come out. Um, so, you know, to get, get back to the lawsuit, technically they filed an appeal to the city to overturn the permit, saying that it was done in error. 
and that hearing was August 6th, which was great for us because we were leaving for Kenya for July, for all of July. So we went and left for Kenya, had a nice break, and in the meantime, we're trying to figure out where the where this poll was, and because we hadn't ordered, uh, we hadn't well, pulled the trigger. Up. We we what um, we received the turbine and the blades, but there's two ways to get the pole. You can get one solid pe one pole that's solid, and that means a crane would have to come in. But then we've got these power lines, and there there was going to be more of a cost associated with getting it over the power lines. And then there is a pole that's a five section pole, it comes in on a truck. It, I think each section weighs 200 pounds, so two men can pick it up and move it. So um, because the product was so new, the company was even trying to figure, was trying to help another company makes the pole. So really, we were just at the very beginning of, uh, of this. So we got the section pole, and that had arrived. And um, so yeah, well, we the, the uh, main, main reason they also do these section poles is they want to be able to deliver these to third world countries. And, Fascinatingly enough, I've, I've read things and going to Kenya, you can see it firsthand, that there's a strong belief that third world countries will be able to embrace this renewable stuff a lot quicker than we are because we have all this antiquated fossil fuel, you know, power delivery technology that's, that's in place. And I'll tell you here, the Georgia Power doesn't give a damn about, you know, green power. They, they have one guy in the green power department and he's really, it's more of a greenwash department. They just care yeah. about making money. Why don't we start the um, installation um, slides that we have. Um, so the height of our pole is 50 feet. It does not require guy wires. They even come out with a sectional pole that will go up to 70 and 90 feet. The reason that we didn't do 70 feet, I wish we had now, it was just all so fresh and new and just the thought of if it falls down, it doesn't hit somebody's home. Not that we thought it would, but you know, you just, that, that was kind of, we were, and it was all new. Now I wish we had a 90 foot pole up there, but. Well, um, to all, also finish our visit to City Hall, we also brought our son Rivers down there. We thought it'd be a great civics lesson for him. So they have probably 30 or 40 people from the neighborhood stand up with their attorney, and it's just the, myself, Christina Rivers, and our attorney, and, and what really, uh, really hurt the, neighborhood association, or this, uh, not the neighborhood association, but just this group of people, is the fact that the historical overlay did not address it specifically enough, so we didn't really do anything wrong. So the city, to their credit and to their wisdom, upheld the permit. And so they said, fine, you know, you're good, good to go, and... Well, you know, we fell into a caveat that was called renewable energy was okay. There was no restraints to that, that the historic um, group would have to okay. So that was, you know, there is obviously a small group right now pining to, to change that. Well, um, but it's, uh, then, then they, you know, I think within 30 days they filed an appeal to the state court of uh, Georgia. And, 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 and it should be important to note that about 30 days ago they withdrew that appeal and their, their attorneys cited lack of support which in our minds means lack of money. And it's also fair to note that in the past 30 days, uh, probably 98% of those signs have come down. Yeah. And, and, you know, what, what, what really floored us is that Grant Park is just a bastion of hippies and gay Liberal. couples and just, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're a lot of, a lot of really out, outside the box. And, you know, even, I mean, even the, even the Atlanta Journal pointed out that the large majority of the population voted for Al Gore. And so it just floored us that, you know, that, 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 that we had any sort of resistance whatsoever. But what really happened as we went on is that it galvanized the old guard because a lot of those people had been there forever. And it was not uncommon to have neighbors just walk up that we'd never met and just either bring us a bottle of wine or just profusely apologize. There was one gentleman when we spoke at a neighborhood meeting that walked up the next day in tears and just said, I am just totally embarrassed because of all the misinformation, and it really gave us, uh, you know, it gave us a tremendous amount of empathy for people that are in the press all the time, and there's a lot of wordsmithing that goes on, and obviously the papers love a controversy, television crews love a controversy, and... Well, what, what happened is, and we'll leave the whole media thing and move on to the installation, but I don't, we don't operate in the public face on a regular basis at all. Kurt has professionally here and there, but they immediately um, put
put out information about us and our character and who we are that was completely wrong and misinformation. And as we evolve through this process, we, which, which comes with some sacrifice, because we, we sat down one day and we said, wait a minute, do we, do we really want to do this? I mean, look, look what's happening to the neighborhood. It's being polarized. You know, our, how are our kids being treated at school? Is somebody going to be so angry that they would do something? You know, walked up one day and I've got a spell on the, my front porch. You know, there was a witch in the neighborhood. I'm, I'm, I mean, it was, it was, there was some cra real craziness there. Um, See, I told so, you there's a lot of hippies in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, so I'm, I, the reason that I want to go there with you guys is because when you make a decision to do something that is outside the box, you, you, you know, there could be some sacrifice that kind of comes along with it. Kurt and I made a pact with each other that we were not going to go out and solicit support for what we were doing. We, we, didn't, we really didn't know the magnitude of this number of this group of people. It turns out, the beautiful thing turns out, that it was a sm very small group of people, probably 20, 20 ish. And, and, we are either the devil or we are heroes in our neighborhood, and most people think we're pioneering heroes. We, we did not have a clue that it would garner this much public attention. There was no, um, that was n no motive at all, believe me. <laughs> um, but, you know, if any of you guys go there, just understand that, that that's kind of a component that could, could happen. And um, I just think it's gonna take a grassroots effort for us to shift and make changes right now in these infrastructures that we have. And you know, the, the, uh, actually the day of the installation was pretty cool. I was just telling Skip and those guys, it was truly like a barn raising. We had people show up we'd never met before, either from the neighborhood or from, had just seen it on, on, on the news somewhere and just said, you know, can we help? And the guys, truck that actually pulled it up, we'd, we'd met for the first time about two hours ago. It was beautiful. And it's also fair to say we had no idea what we were doing. No one in, the, in these photos had ever put one of these things up, obviously. It was the first one in Georgia. We, we literally went to the manual and we read We were just going page by page, do this, do that, do that. We had our electrician lined up to come around 2 o'clock because we thought that's when we were going to hook up the wires. Um, <laughs> It did take the whole day, but please note that it was August the 8th, there was no wind blowing, and it was 103 degrees. See this guy it right here so next, next to the wind power device, Gary. He's an English fella, and he's the one who's really kind of driving the ship, Gary. And he's uh, typically the toughest guy in any room, and, and so he's the one who did the foundation, he did the bolt patterns, and he took great pride in what he was doing, because obviously he, you know, he knew that this is some pioneering stuff. So what you do is you lay the, put the pieces of the pole together. It had a little hook um, on, the la on the top section, and there was a wire that you run, so you crank the wire to tighten it up as much as you can. Did that a couple times. And then we had to put the turbine head on. We literally had the manual out with the screws and the bolts, and we're screwing it in and making sure we did it right, and then we put the blades on and you can kind of see. See in this photo here, you can see our son Rivers and yeah. you can see the manual down underneath him. So we're always, you know, somebody <laughs> said, well, who, who has the manual? Who has the manual? Let's read through that. Um, <clears throat> and then it's hanging out on, onto the sidewalk and we look up and we see the, all the power lines and we're just like, oh my God, is it going to clear that? So um, there we are all together. We're all talking about, are we ready? Um, so then the way that the base is, there's these bolts. And you, can, you can tell by here, if you can see the wire yeah. from, the, from the pole, you can see the gin pole kit. There's Does what's called a gin somebody? pole, and you go like that, and then it, it's the base of the pole, so the truck pulls it, and it pulls the base up, gets it to a certain point, and then you can just manually push it down, literally, and it falls, if your person's done the foundation correctly, it falls over the bolts, and then you have washers that are that big, and you screw the washers in. So. So here's, here's the guy here with this plastic pole right here to make sure that we clear those power lines because we looks like it might have been off maybe, you know, a couple of inches here or there. 
So he, he, he did have to actually pull, push some of those power lines to make sure the blade cleared it as, as it was going up because had we not been able to do that, Georgia Power would have had to come out and shut down the grid. and it, I mean, it just would have been a nightmare. And then you'll notice what we had to do here is we had to dig a trench for the gin pole kit because it was not able to lay flush. So some of this obviously was a dynamic process. And the second one's always the easiest one. So we got it up, and then we had the leveling question, but we just dealt with that the next day because we were all so exhausted. We just celebrated the fact that it was up. And of course, we um, just had to get a keg and invite some people over to celebrate. <laughs> and this is, this is Because the you truth. know the hippies love beer, too. <laughs> and we invited everybody. We sent an email out, and um, this is the truth. It was 6 o'clock the next night, and the skies opened up and a storm blew in and the wind blew and it, it just <sighs> and so the sound that it makes is it's a really low hum and, and unless you know what it is you don't even hear it it truly the, the brochure says it doesn't make any louder noise than the rustling of the wind going through the trees and it, it's really true it's kind of like you know what you're the sound your baby makes, and when you hear that voice, you, you know it. But um, it's, um, as Kurt says, I dare say if we were in a beauty contest with the utility poles and lines, we, we might win the Tell contest. me which one you think is sexy. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really, really awesome feeling when it turns. Um, it's a dynamic process because you get to sit there and watch it. With, with other things like solar, you don't. And so ne next we kind of went through a phase, the technical phase of, of the device. And mind you, it, this is, again, it's brand new. Like I just went out to go buy my iPhone and it didn't work. I had to return it and get, a, get another one. Well, we, we, we went through a little bit of that with this. Um, well, but she also dropped it in the toilet, so it went well, from an iPhone to a T phone. <laughs> Um, okay, so it, the device comes with software. Unfortunately, the software was still in beta mode, and it still is today, where the software plugs into the inverter head, and when it, you can pull it up on your computer all the time, and it'll show you what the RPMs are, what the wind speed is, what it's generating. It just unfortunately is not working where it's creating a a log of the data, but we can pull it up and look at it. So, like like uh, most technology, it's still in beta test, and they shoved it out the door before it was truly ready. And this is actually our third inverter, and what I mean by inverter, just where, where the blades are housed, because the first inverter lost the communication technology. This also has a neat safety feature yeah. in that it has to sense uh, power coming from the grid. There's 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 breaks in there. If it doesn't sense the power, those breaks shut out because you don't want to arbitrarily, you know, fry a, a power technician if there's an ice storm or something. So the technology was such that those brakes had, had kind of, so we had to actually get a bucket truck out, out there and, and had to replace that. Then there was some communication issues. And so, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's cutting edge technology. This one finally works, but as, as, as she said, we, we can now pull it up on the computer and we can see how much power is being generated, but we can't what's called data log. So when people say, well, how much power are you producing? We don't know. But we can tell you that our power bill is anywhere from 100 to 120 bucks. And I was just telling these guys that the house next to us, which is smaller and, and, and older, told us their bill has been anywhere from 350 to 450. Now, that's not just all the wind power device. It's also fair to say we did icing and insulation. We did a bunch of stuff to the house to try to make it as green as we could. We're working with Georgia Power right now. Um, they are going to separately meter the turbine because everybody, that's the number one question, is what is it generating? And so we're, we, we are, we've just put on what I didn't realize was, a, was what's called a bi-directional meter, and it will actually show us and Georgia Power what excess we generate. The, it, it meters that separately. There's two meters, and then we will meter the turbine itself um, so that we'll keep a running record on that. And I think what, 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 what will be fair is that we have a year of that data and get an average. 
and Georgia Power's been about four or five months behind getting that meter to us. We were at the point where we were going to just go buy the meter ourselves, put it on there. But they the just other, called the me today, thing. and they're coming out Monday, literally, to, to meter the turbines. So, um, the other thing we're trying to do is to get Georgia Power, because they'll purchase solar power back at 17 cents a kilowatt. But it's not a federal mandate to do that with solar, so they wouldn't do that for us. But perhaps that'll, that'll, that'll change in the Public Service Commission. So. Um, we, we, just to touch on briefly, the other quick fe features that we did with, um, is it still flipping through those slides? Or is that the end of it? Could be the end of it. And it's, and it's also fair to say that the, uh, the uh, potential, yeah, yeah the uh, potential with this is to produce 700 kilowatts a month in optimal conditions. The average household uses about 1,200. So again, we, we knew that ours would not be optimal, and we had really reasoned or had reconciled that our payback would be 20 years, but again, if you're doing a 30-year mortgage, then we benefit day one. And as I've told people in the apartment business that I come from, I've, I've been had a passion for utilities for years purely because it saved money. And as I've told a lot of people, there's no greater waste than in utilities if we purchase an extra refrigerator that you didn't need. At least you have an extra refrigerator. But if you waste water or power or everything else, that, that doesn't benefit anybody. It's, it's horrible for the, the property owner, for the residents, for the, for the municipality. And, and, you know, I, I even told people 15 years ago that our next war is to be fought over water. And you can see if you read in the paper in Atlanta that, uh, you know, when the, when the crews... We put the wind power device, the crews filmed it, left. Well, guess what? They came back 30 days later and said, well, tell us about your gray water system because this is the first gray water system in Georgia, so we thought we would throw this in there as well. This is called the BRAC system. It's manufactured in Canada, and it's real simple technology, and I've never been accused of not being able to make a decision. I decided to buy this in about five minutes over the phone. When the guy told me about it and did the math, I said, yeah, we're in. And so how it works is it takes all the water from your shower, tu uh, shower tub, um, I'm sorry, bathroom shower, bathtub, and sink. It takes nothing from the kitchen because you've got water or food waste in there. And it basically dumps it into a 55-gallon tank, chlorinates it, filters it. Now we have also have a UV light on it. This is new technology as well, so we've had some mod modifications of that. And it basically pumps it back up to your toilet. So if your toilets are 30% of your total use, then your consumption automatically drops 30%. So for a average family of four with the city of Atlanta water rates today, uh, we will have a payback of about three and a half years, which is incredibly strong. That's like falling off a log to me. <clears throat> so we put this system in, first one in Georgia, several have put it in because obviously this is a lower price point. I think the device itself is $1,200. For a plumber to put it in, it's roughly 700 but you do have to have access to all of your plumbing. So if you're a single floor house with a crawl area, chances are it's going to be easier. Obviously for us, because we were rehabbing the entire house, every, everything was pretty open. <clears throat> well, I don't we're going to take some questions uh, before we run out of time, and they have to fly up. Bob, right there. This is our segue into food. Uh, when you set the pole, how, I'm over here. When you set the pole, how far down did you have to dig and how many cubic yards of concrete did you have to use? It was, uh, the hole itself was about 10 by 10 by 10 and I think it was about five cubic yards, but. Um, and the shape of it was it had a base that was about four feet high with rebar it had a, through it? it had a leg on it. And then we had so it was a square a with like a leg right here that stuck up out of the ground with the bolt pattern on it. There you go, Bob. Uh, I don't have an engineering degree and don't want one, but can you explain in layman's terms a little bit more detail about how this connects to Georgia Power? Sure. It's, it's, it's uh, very simple. 
there are three wires that come from the turbine itself that go down the pole. They've got a disconnect box for, you know, code reasons. And it literally goes in one side of the meter. So you've got Georgia Power on this side, the uh, wind power device on this side. So as Christine mentioned, in theory, if everything were off in the house, the refrigerator and everything, say it was nighttime, and so we're not pulling anything, anything from the grid, and if wind's blowing, then power is coming from the wind power device, and in theory, the meter's spinning backwards. And as she mentioned earlier, Georgia Public Service mandates net metering, so uh, we get a net power bill, basically. Does that make sense? So the question is, how do you service the blades, and how do you get up there? What, what, what we did is in our backyard is we left a section down, and we left an area open where if we need to, which we have had to twice, we've had to get a bucket truck in, in, in there to service it. And obviously for an urban setting, it's more difficult. They tell you it's better for three-quarters of an acre in an open field, and it's easier to service. Plus in that area, you could probably drop it down with a gin pole with us. That's... That's, you know, you can't do that. And then how often do they say we need to service it? Because I, I want to say it was like five years. It was uh, you know, I think they said five to seven years again because they tried to do it where it, where it required as little maintenance as possible. Yes, sir. What was your source of data for the wind and the speeds? The first part. And the, you second, know, and the second part of the question is, I assume the turbine generates AC. What is the inverter for? The inverter converts it from DC to AC or vice versa. It uh, converts it from DC to AC. And then, right. Uh, and then in terms of the wind power, I basically went on the inter internet and just looked at a lot of sites. And then since then, there's a website that looks like that people who fly small planes use that tell you about wind speed and not, not, not just the weather, but wind speed throughout the day, which we were obviously very curious about. And so I looked at probably two or three different websites that all gave me pretty much, you know, Atlanta is 9.3 miles per hour average throughout the year. It's also uh, important to note that during the change in the seasons, obviously wind is the kinetic energy of the earth. It's the uneven heating of the earth's surface. So obviously in the dead of summer, you're not going to have as much wind, or in the dead of winter, maybe not as much wind. It's during the fall and the spring seasons where you have the temperature differential that creates, you know, a lot of wind. So now we're, we're seeing a lot of wind right now. You know, if you have a sincere interest in the sky stream, you could um, call Southwest Wind Power, and the way they're set up is they have distributors, and then call the distributor and have them come out. Um, as another distributor came out to our house, and he had some real sophisticated software system that shows the topo of everything and could, could pick up some, some wind variables beyond just what we found on the website was the um, airport, you know, wind calculation. So that might be a way to get even more information about your particular site. I think we have time for one more question. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm glad the spell didn't work. Uh, it seems like you guys have a really good uh, wind turbine. Um, I was looking at some of the pictures, and you guys had quite a few people helping you with this thing. What, like about 10 people? Is yes. that right? Yeah? Okay. Um, it seems like it was a, like a community effort, of a, in a sense. And since you guys have had it up for a while, would you say that there's been kind of a green buzz? Is there some sort of community movement now that they see this thing every day and it's kind well, of you know, real? Well, uh, you know, five out of ten photographers that show up ring the doorbell and say, where's the turbine? So they don't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, we, we were asked to be on the holiday home tour, which was, we were going to be on the holiday home tour, you know, I wasn't ready for it, but it, it, let, it brought people into our home. And some people came into our home that didn't, under, didn't know what was going on, and they were in the house, and they heard us talking about it, and they said, do you have what? Do you have a wind turbine? Where is it? I mean, they walked up to the house and didn't even see it. Um, 
To answer your question, it's, it is um, our neighborhood association just kicked out the president that was really the head of this whole movement against us. Our, our, it, it's created a beautiful thing, and that's the great part of our story and how it's ended. I mean, our neighbors, our new neighbors next to us that bought the house, that wouldn't sell, that the people got the price that they had on the house, et cetera. It would, just took a couple more months to find these guys. They were mowing their front yard with an electric lawnmower. Well, we hadn't really gotten to that part, so we walked over and we were like, okay, tell us about this electric lawnmower. And they told us all the homework they did, and then they said, well, we did this because of you. You inspired us. We, were, we, didn't, even, we didn't even think this way. You know, now we recycle. We didn't recycle before. So it's, it, it just, you know, it just is a, that makes me feel great. It, it becomes this thing, and it, and it gets into the consciousness of the people around you. And, and I want to end by saying that if there's one thing you walk away with today is ask yourself, when you go buy something, why are you buying it? Where did it come from? Who made it? Uh, was there an environmental consciousness about it when it was made? I mean, you, you can have, it's like, it's like making a vote every time you do something because there's companies and corporations that, that hire people that watch buying trends and then they go and produce things and make things. And I thought I was going to be talking to a younger student body crowd today and I was going to say, you know, do you use the same washing detergent? that your parents used at home? Is that, who uses the same detergent that their parents use? The young, see? Well, you know, they make so many wonderful biodegradable detergents now. And we do so many things out of habit. And it's really made us question all of our habits. I mean, I still catch myself doing stuff and I say, why did I do that? You know, because there's, there's not a, I didn't, I didn't send a good message back um, out into corporate world and back into the environmental world. So, you know, it's going to take a movement by all of us. I think the government has good intent, local and federal, but they are big and they take a long time to make changes and to make shifts and make movements. And we just all have to have a really loud voice. So, yeah. Gary, do you have any closing remarks? Thanks for having us. It's great. Yeah, we're flattered. All right.